Good morning and uh, welcome to the weekly live organized by the European Training Foundation called Learning Connects and welcome to all of you who are following this conversation wherever you are on YouTube, on LinkedIn and on the Facebook account of the ETF. Um, I'll go straight to uh, introducing uh, the distinguished speakers of today's conversation, which will focus on a topic which is pretty innovative, super relevant, the individual learning accounts. And I'd like to welcome to the conversation my colleagues, Javier Mateo de Cortada, head of the Knowledge Hub department. Welcome, Javier. Thank you. Well, good morning. And to uh, Yorgos Sissimos, Head of the Policy Advice at the EU Programming Unit. Thanks for being with us, Yorgos. Good morning. Thank you, Daria. And thanks also to my colleague, Maria Alvova, who is helping out with the technicalities of this conversation. And to all of you who are following from wherever you are, let us know where you are from. So say hi, let us know the country or the city, and do not hesitate to intervene in this conversation. Quick note. Compared to other interviews, this one is a flash conversation. It will last only 30 minutes, so we will have uh, still uh, 26 for uh, keeping on in this discussion and pick up your questions. So let's please all get involved. Thank you very much. So uh, let's begin with uh, Yorgos. Dear Yorgos, we talk about individual learning accounts, but what does that mean? How does it work? What is an individual learning account? Thank you, Daria. I, I think this is, as you said, a very timely discussion. Uh, the last uh, few years, um, this discussion is, is ongoing in, in uh, the European Union, but also in the member states. Some member states, they have uh, used individual learning accounts uh, for, for some decades now. But uh, I think at EU level, this is a rather new discussion. And of course, we had recent developments as well. So individual learning account is for the individual, first of all. So um, the learners, these are the individuals. Uh, we're talking about adults, about uh, the, the working uh, population, let's say. They are accounts in the sense that in different formats, because there are different formats, is, um, you, you can save and some, some rights, let's say, which will be used for learning. Learning in this case means training, upskilling and reskilling. So it is a tool. It is a tool that uh, countries are using in their own context. There are different variations. So in, in some cases, uh, they have different names. Uh, when we say an account, in some cases, it could be a virtual one where you, you have these rights, the entitlements, as they call them, for training. In some other cases, it is an account in a bank where you have resources, where you, um, you save some funds that you can use for training. In some other cases, it's, it's, it's just um, um, a scheme for, for, for vouchers as a subsidy. So it is a tool, it has different forms, it's all about training, upskilling, reskilling for adults, for individuals. That's what uh, uh, they are, and they are used in different countries in different forms. Thank you very much, Yorgos, for this uh, clarification on what we're talking about. I think this sets up super well the basis for the ongoing, uh, ongoing discussion. Ooh. You've just said that uh, countries are developing things in similar or different ways. So I'd like to give the floor now to Javier, uh, because uh, we as the European Training Foundation are working in countries outside of the European Union. So what is the state of play of development of individual learning accounts in the EU neighborhood? And what does it mean for countries to invest in this field? Okay, uh, let me start uh, for the second and then I will go to the first. Um, I think the, the something the, the lifelong learning uh, principle has been in, in the agenda for already for many years. And uh, it's clear that uh, for individuals to, to be competitive and to increase employability for and uh, productiveness and so on, it is needed to update the skills. This is something that is known since uh, many years. What is uh, new now and why this is again in the agenda and it's acquiring a high priority is the fact that uh, uh, we are facing this uh, huge uh, 
uh, transition, uh, this triple transition, uh, where we have to um, have, uh, have to be greening, uh, the greening, the technological change, the demographical change, uh, and so on. And and this has to be inclusive. That's the the, the issue that we are facing. And in order to do that. Um, Everybody understands that there are different dimensions. One of them is the skills and education and skills. And if you want to do that, um, you cannot only count on the formal education systems. No? So the, it's not only what is happening in the education establishment or even in the higher uh, high education in the universities. Most of the people update their skills and, and re-skilling re change the, the skills become obsolete through non-formal and informal uh, learning and for that um, the policies normally are not uh, so well structured and in this case uh, if we want uh, lifelong learning to to be the, one of the instruments that are used to to face this transition we need to have uh, schemes that allow people to easily access to quality training that allows them for this uh, fast transition from the point of view of skills Okay, this is uh, for, for everyone. It is for the European Union member states, but it's also for our partner countries. Then in our partner countries, the situation is uh, even more urgent because uh, the starting point when uh, they are facing these new challenges is that the, the number of people who participate in um, continuous training eh? this is something that has been that is recorded in the labor force survey so we know some data at least for some countries it's rather slow it's rather small sorry so um, dates that we have uh, data we have for 12 countries indicates that uh, this runs apart from israel which probably is uh, closer to the situation of some member states uh, we go from uh, the number of people 0.8 percent in the case of Albania to 5.7 in the case of Turkey. When we are talking of uh, the, in the same period, the reference for the the average for the EU was 10.8, and now we are talking that uh, with the new policy documents we want to go for almost half of the population by the year uh, 2030 having some uh, activity of training uh, during the, the the year so i think they really the, the challenge is huge and that, that's the, the starting point in the partner countries thank you very much javier uh, and uh, before going back to your ghost i'd like to uh, remind our followers to let us know where they are watching from. Uh, for the time being, we know that uh, we have um, a friend uh, interested into what we are discussing who is following us from the Philippines. So uh, way beyond the EU neighborhood and you are most welcome to join the conversation and don't hesitate to send your comments and, and questions. Um, Yorgos, uh, Javier already uh, introduced uh, a topic which is um, very relevant for the action of the ETF and most importantly this month in which we are devoting our communication campaign to the topic of lifelong learning. Um, so uh, could you elaborate a bit more following up on what uh, Javier just said? on why we are talking about individual learning accounts in the framework of our reflections on lifelong learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daria. Yes, um, I, I think one of the fundamental aims of this, um, of this tool of individual learning accounts is to, to, to make the gap for, for, um, for access to, to training and learning for the adults uh, smaller. Now, the question is where they, why there is a gap. Why, why there is a difficulty for adults uh, to, to, to access training. And there are many, many different reasons. Uh, and what is the need for that, of course. So um, we are talking nowadays uh, for um, uh, change in the labor market, jobs that uh, they don't uh, uh, exist anymore, new jobs coming up. Uh, we are talking for less, less uh, security in, the, in many, many jobs. Um, we talk about digitalization, where this it creates a, a huge need to adapt our skills uh, 
for, for new jobs. We're talking about demographic issues as well that demand uh, attention and they have an impact on, on, on upskilling and reskilling. So this is what defines, let's say, the limits of, uh, of lifelong learning. Yeah? So lifelong learning is not a new concept. Uh, Xavier said it earlier on. It exists for centuries, of course, but I think the nature of lifelong learning is what is changing nowadays and the pace of lifelong learning. And uh, uh, the, the, the individual learning accounts they are trying to, to, to address uh, in a way, I mean, there are many other measures on the table, but uh, it's a tool that can be used to, to, to provide access to improve uh, uh, employability, um, to, to also give a sense of ownership for the adults on their own learning. Um, adults, they do know what the needs are for their own learning. If, if not, then there's an element of career guidance that uh, could be considered. Um, but then, of course, how you match those needs of learning with, um, with a training program, that's an element that comes into, the, into this discussion of individual learning accounts. So, the overarching issue is lifelong learning, the need that we need to upskill and reskill, and I think it's, 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 it's an obvious sort of uh, dimension. Uh, and the other one is how do you do that? And one way to do that is through the individual learning accounts and through this sort of idea of entitlements, that moving from jobs, you can have this entitlement to um, uh, on, on learning and upskill. Up, up um, I think this uh, has, you know, it's, it's a complex discussion. It sounds easy, but uh, of course it's, it's, it's a big policy area. Um, it's, it's testing the limits of the systems. So when we're talking about uh, vocational education and training, and uh, we're focusing on, on uh, initial uh, vocational education training systems. Now, of course, the discussion is about continuous uh, vocational education training, and and that expands, of course, the systems because uh, the, the population that now is uh, is relevant is is much much bigger. So um, it, there are issues of financing, there are issues of, of governance. We, we we can discuss those later on, but uh, these are all linked with this idea of lifelong learning and how this is linked to to to, to the individual learning. Thank you very much, uh, Yorgos. You also brought some points which uh, I will kindly ask uh, Javier to follow up. But before uh, I see that uh, the numbers of hellos uh, are growing, so I'd like to say uh, hi to our followers, as I said, from the Philippines, from North Macedonia, from Italy, from Portugal, from Moscow, from Georgia. We are expanding geographically. Thank you so much for being with us. Keep on letting us know where you're from. And if you have a doubt or a question or a comment on this conversation, we'll be most happy to take it on board, but be informed that today it's going to be shorter. So we'll end up in less than 15 minutes. Um, Javier, uh, Yorgos just flagged that uh, the point. He said that uh, we are testing the limits of the system. Uh, before he um, highlighted some pros of developing individual learning accounts in the framework of lifelong learning. But what are the cons? Are there disagreements on the usefulness of this tool? Are there different aspects that uh, policymakers should keep into account when elaborating how to eventually develop a well-functioning system? Okay, I think uh, Georgos already said a couple of, uh, of things which are fundamental. We can elaborate more. One is financing, the other one is, is uh, governance. So I think these are two fundamental things. I would like to expand um, later on if, if possible, but now, um, I would concentrate on a couple of things. One is is, is access. Uh, so normally uh, those schemes, when they exist, work well with the employees in, in a company. Uh, it works uh, less well with the uh, people with uh, have 
um, let's say, non-standard uh, labor relations. So, for example, all this uh, issue of platform economy or people who work on uh, self-employed, these people normally it's difficult to organize how to access to the system of uh, uh, learning accounts in general or training funds in general. So this is a, a problem that needs to be addressed. The same happens with those who are not really uh, even working. No? So the, the people who are uh, unemployed normally can go through the employment services. Those who are unemployed but are not registered do not have access. Those who are needs, who are not in the education or the employment, uh, neither. No? And these are people who regularly uh, the need of them in terms of reskilling, upskilling is high. Then the statistics we have about the lifelong learning in, in everywhere, also in in all the OECD countries, but then in our partner countries as well, says that the, those who benefit more about um, uh, this continuous training is the people with uh, higher um, levels of skills, high, higher income, and uh, those who are more in, in big companies. So the majority of people who are in small companies or who have a middle to low level of skills, uh, those do not benefit so much about language learning. And these are those who are more exposed when there are changes in the labor market, important changes in the labor market. So one of the issues really is how to attract these people, to motivate them so they understand that the, they have the right to to access to training and it's not only the right it's always a, it's even a, a great opportunity for them to remain in the in the in the labor market to remain employed and to even develop in their career if they don't do that the the risk of becoming obsolete uh, their skills or being um, losing their job is high so i think that's one of the big issues the another thing that is important is that the, in terms of the career, lifelong learning, is um, the common to all the learning, or which is non-formal, informal system. Countries are developing systems to validate the learning that people take place outside the formal education, because normally the formal education, the the, the vet schools, the higher education, and so on. They you end that with a qualification which is connected with the qualification system, and that's uh, something that is recognized by everybody. When you make some training in in, in inside the company or with an NGO or a community center, or you do it online, or you do it by yourself with self learning, you need to have systems that connect this learning and the skills and competences that you have developed through this. Uh, uh, non-formal learning or informal learning with the, the qualifications because it's when afterwards this training will be used and then with the individual learning accounts it comes to the point if the individual has a choice to decide with the support uh, with the guidance all these things which are things also needed to be developed they can decide which training and where to take this training this then has to be finally there needs to be systems mechanisms where you can uh, check what you've been learning and someone says well this is connected with some part of a qualification it happens the same with the micro credentials which is another topic which the problem is exactly the same how you connect this with the big system of qualification which has been established which are the, the, the skills and competencies related with the big qualifications that are recognized by the different uh, institutional and employers and everywhere. So these are some of the elements that are also connected with, with this ILA. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Javier. Indeed, the, the challenge seems pretty big in uh, succeeding in implementing a well-functioning system to the benefit of, uh, of both uh, workers and employers and um, for, for, for better opportunities for all. But uh, uh, discussions are in place uh, and uh, I am aware uh, that uh, there are ongoing discussions, uh, there is an ongoing policy discussion at an EU level on the future development of the international learning accounts. Uh, Jorgos, would you like please to let us know um, a bit more about this? It could be interesting both for our EU followers and also followers from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. 
In that area, yes, the, the, the European Commission has a planned um, activity initiative to, to come up um, with, with a document, a policy document on, on individual learning accounts by the end of this year. So very soon, the next few months. I think what we're uh, following now is, is, is the preparatory discussion for that, for that document. One important uh, stage of this preparatory discussion, I think, is, that, is the discussion that took place in the ACVT uh, platform. Um, for, for the people who are following, just to say that the ACVT is, it stands for the Advisory Committee for Vocational Education Training. It's one of the oldest uh, expert uh, uh, groups that the European Commission has, and it's an advisory body. So it provides advice to the Commission. So the ACVT committee, where you have the employers from the member states, you have the employees, the organizations of the employees from the member states, um, and the governments from the member states, and also from, from our friends in the candidate countries that uh, we are working with them. So this three-partite body has uh, had a very busy summer this, this year because they had to come up with an opinion in a very, very short time. And um, they came up with some um, uh, reasoning, let's say, that could help the European Commission shape its uh, initiative. Now, what, what, what are the main, main issues here? The first uh, thing that um, the, the ACBT opinion highlights is, first of all, the idea of a, of, of a context. Like any tool, uh, it's effective only if it's used in the right context. So, basically what it means is that in different countries you may have different uh, variations or, or policies that they do similar uh, jobs to, to the idea of the individual learning accounts. Um, and, and of course, uh, the ACT stresses this uh, the principle of subsidiarity. That means that the, the member states are responsible to, to, to structure, organize their, their policies on education and training. So that has to be taken into account. Um, there's an element of, of consensus um, there, and uh, it's, it's very important because you need the social partners, so, so uh, you, you need the, the, the employers, but also the employees' organizations, and, and you need an agreement between them because, of course, this has an impact on, 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 the, on, the, on, on their, um, their role. Uh, but also you need uh, the countries to, to be part of this discussion because it's linked with, with uh, finance, as we said earlier on, with, with resources and uh, policies that they have already in place. So uh, the discussion was very, very interesting. There, there is now an agreed uh, uh, ACBT opinion that is in the, let's say, uh, in the hands of the European Commission uh, to, to use it for, for the next um, for the next steps. The, the other thing that I think is important to stress is, is, um, is the value of, of, of the system. So to have a continuous VET system, a good continuous VET system, you need a good initial VET system. And of course, these two are very important for the tool that you will use, either this is an individual learning account or a system voucher or, or um, whatever else to, 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 to offer training training courses. Um, there was also another issue which um, some member states they have put on the table which um, refers to the idea that any sort of individual learning account approach or tool should not, let's say, replace existing agreements and existing schemes that the countries have. This is linked a lot with um, this principle of subsidiarity and that they need to, to have this space to shape their own, uh, their own approach. So this opinion now, as I said, is in the hands of the European Commission. Let's see what will come at the end of the year. The European Commission had already an open consultation. So whoever had an experience or an opinion, you know, uh, individuals, or organizations could, could do that. That was run for a few months in the summer and September. And um, now we'll see what, uh, what will be the, the, the outcome of that initiative. Thank you, Yorgos. And indeed, we will uh, reconvene uh, our conversation on the next uh, developments of the individual learning accounts in the next month. So I invite all of you who are following and are interested on the topic to uh, keep on following the conversations we are having live uh, because 
we will discuss about this topic again. And we are, we are close to the conclusion of our conversation, but I'd like to say hello also to our followers from Moldova, from Tunisia, from North Macedonia. And I'd like to pick up a question coming from Ange Carpio Reyes. Thank you for addressing your question, Ange. Uh, what effects, if any, do uh, the individual learning accounts have on the uh, current setup of programs for development. How would these programs be recreated to accommodate the individual learning accounts? Who would like to pick up this uh, question, Yorgos or Javier? Um, I can say something. I think the one of the really of the of the issues of the of the individual learning accounts is the how to reconcile the fact that uh, it is the responsibility of the individual to to use these resources no matter in which uh, uh, modality it is with the fact that uh, these can be then useful also for the, uh, uh, the the competitiveness of the companies and the comp of the economy as such so so the relevance of of the of the training and this refers a lot to to what Ange is saying so to what extent there are programs which have their own logic and i think the individual learning accounts is not going to be a program of, of training what well, it is a way of accessing to existing um, provision of training that is already there in the, in in the market or in the companies or in the community the, the other thing is that uh, what the 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 learning accounts require is that uh, there is a quality assurance of all this training that is afford, um, accessible by, by by the individuals. Let me say something to, to add to what uh, Georgos was saying, just something, there are uh, several issues, but one of them is the issue of uh, sustainability of the system for the, for the partner countries. So we need the uh, 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 to understand that the, that the cost of the system needs to be decided uh, considering that everybody is contributing there. They, of course, the governments, uh, the employers and, and the individuals themselves can be contributing through this, for example, their contributions to the social security and so on. Uh, and in the case of a countries of uh, where there is a uh, countries in, in developing countries, there is also normally donors and uh, development banks and so on who are also bringing con uh, investment and and financing into the system. The thing is, is this going to be sustainable in the future? And that's what is important. Now, they, they, whatever the solution it is found in the different contexts, we need to see that this afterwards can be sustained in the years because uh, perhaps we need to go for systems which are more uh, more modest by reaching more people rather than systems which are very well defined but only very few are benefiting so these are the options that are, need to be made in, now with the implementation and this of course creates a lot of polemics you can imagine Thank you very much, uh, Javier. And indeed, uh, creating a sustainable system is uh, like an insurance for the, the system to uh, keep on developing and be naturally lasting for long. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all of the participants to this conversation. I see that there are more greetings coming from Bulgaria and uh, two more from Georgia. We have reached the 30 minutes we had devoted to this flash conversation on the individual learning accounts. But as we flagged during this conversation, a lot of work is ongoing for the improvements uh, and the developments of a well-functioning sustainable system. And uh, we'll get back to you with uh, an announcement of a new conversation later this year. And for the time being, I'd like to thank you all for following and I'd like to Thank the distinguished speaker of today, Javier Mateo de Cortada, head of the Knowledge Hub Department at the ETF. Thanks, Javier. Thanks, thanks to you for inviting me. And uh, thanks a lot to Yorgos Tsisimos, head of the Policy Advice and EU Programming Unit at the ETF. Thank you, Yorgos. Thank you, Daria, and thank you to the, to the followers. 
And uh, again, thanks a lot for following us. The next appointment would be next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Central European time for a conversation about excellence in lifelong learning with the interesting cases of members of our NA network for the Centers of Vocational Excellence. Thanks a million. Have a lovely day, everyone, wherever you are. And let's be in touch. Bye. Yeah.